Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been five years since we read this book, A House United, together as our joint uh, Lenten observance, all the way back in 2019. Anybody remember it? Good, that's good. It made an impact, I can see. (laughs) Well, when we did read this book together, I was especially interested in reading it because that year, that Lent, we were going into what promised to be a contentious election, a presidential election in 2020. And I thought it was important for us to read about what Christian unity might look like. When we read that book um, during Lent of 2019, we had no way of knowing that we would be divided physically by COVID-19 when the 2020 election came around. Had no idea how deep the divides would be. Well, the thesis of this book, A House United, is that the Christian church can be and should be the catalyst for bridging the divides that have become entrenched in our nation and throughout the world. Those divides are grounded in a lack of trust and respect and a belief that those divides can never be crossed and that our wounds can never be healed. The author, Alan Hilton, argues that the divide can be crossed and that our wounds can in fact be healed and that there can be unity, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us and among us. As a result, Hilton writes that the Christian church has a unique role to play and a responsibility to be the catalyst for that peace and that unity, which can only be established if and when, unfortunately, that peace can only be established if and when there is peace and unity in the church itself. And I'm sorry to say there is not. There is unfortunately not unity in the church today, nor was there unity in the church at the time that Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians that we just heard read. Paul is writing to a church in Corinth that he had helped to establish. And he went there after he and Silas had been um, ushered out of Thessalonica. You remember last week they came looking for him and they arrested Jason, whom they had been staying with. And, and uh, Paul and Silas left Thessalonica. They end up going to Beroea, where uh, Paul again preached the gospel and uh, a number of Jews there were responding. And the good folks in Thessalonica heard that Paul was uh, preaching in Beroea. So they went not to hear his message, but to cause a stink as they had in Thessalonica, which again forced Paul to move on once again. This time he went by himself to Athens. And while he was there, he went and he preached and taught in the synagogue and in the marketplace, as was his custom. And he even found himself in front of the Areopagus, where he challenged the Athenians' use of idols claiming that as he had walked through their city, he had even seen an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. They worshiped every God and they worried about leaving any out, so they even had an idol to the God that they didn't even know. Well, Paul told the Athenians that rather than worshiping an unknown God, they should worship the true God. The God who has made God's self known through the creation of the world and everything in it, He told them that they needed to repent, to do away with those idols and worship the true God who created them in God's image. From Athens, Paul went to Corinth, which is where where the story picks up in Acts. And he stayed there with fellow tent makers, Aquila and Priscilla, for about a year and a half. So in his first letter to the Corinthians that we also read from, Paul is writing to a church and to a people that he knew well. Now in his introduction to his letter, Paul appeals to them as brothers and sisters, not only because of his relationship with them, but their relationship 
with one another, even amidst the division and conflicts that he knew that existed among them. These divisions that are caustic and contrary to the mission of the church that he had helped them to establish in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul's letter is both good news and bad news to us today. It's good news to know that division in the church is nothing new. There were divisions and and differences of opinions and factions in the church all the way back in the first century since its beginning. That's great news to know that, that that our divisions and differences are nothing new, right? But it's bad news to know that there have been divisions and factions and things that divide us within the church forever. And maybe the problem seems hopeless. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth, I think he could be writing to us today. In fact, I think he is writing it to us. He's writing it to Ascension Lutheran Church. He's writing it to the broader Christian church, past, present, and future. For there are examples of division within the church from every century, from every decade, from every year. From every season in the church calendar, there are divisions in the church probably every Sunday. There's some conflict going on, if we're being honest. These divisions have led to the Great Schism, the Reformation, the proliferation of different denominations, and countless, countless congregational splits. Do you realize that there are over 40 different Lutheran denominations in the United States? That's just Lutheran. Churches, Christian churches, Protestant churches, Lutheran churches just don't get along. And rather than working through our differences, we divide. We split. We take our religious toys and we go off to play by ourselves. Where we'll do it right. Not like those other people. Paul writes to a church that had become divided. Divided based upon the congregants' allegiance towards different leaders in the church. Mr. Justin alluded to it in the children's message. Some apparently preferred Paul. Others Apollos and still others Cephas, who is Peter. And even some, some said they belonged to Christ. As a result, the church was not united. They were divided. Some scholars have suggested that these divisions were were based upon where these folks worshipped and whose home did they worship, and then they identified with a different leader based upon where they worshipped. This is the modern day equivalent to, to churches being divided based on what time people worship and the style of their worship. And when it is drawn out, you know, unfortunately allegiances are made. People say, my pastor is the best, and while that really feeds my ego, thank you, for those of you who've said it, (laughs) it does nothing to help with the unity within the Christian church, within this congregation, within our denomination, within the broader Christian church. So what does bring us together? What unites us? Where is our unity? Mr. Justin said it, it is in our baptism. But it's not, in, it's not about who baptized us or even where we were baptized. I've heard it said, well, I was born a Lutheran. I've been baptized a Lutheran. As though that gets us to the front of the line. Do we belong to Paul or Paulus? Cephas? Do we belong to Pastor Mike? To Pastor Alan? To Pastor Cindy? To Pastor Bruce? To Pastor Scott? No. No, no, no. Regardless of who baptized us, we belong to the one in whose name we were baptized. We belong to Jesus Christ. Elsewhere in Paul's letters, he describes what happens through our baptism as dying to ourselves in order that we might be raised not into the name of the person who's 
baptizing us, but we might be raised in Christ. And even elsewhere, he he writes or describes this process as being clothed in Christ, taking on Christ so we become someone new through the waters of holy baptism. This doesn't happen because of who baptized us, but because we have been baptized in Christ. And it is in Christ that we are made one. And then, my friends, we celebrate and we participate in that unity when we share Holy Communion together. For it, like baptism, is a sacrament through which the grace of God is given to each and every one of us. And we receive that grace as we are reminded of the power of the cross upon which Jesus died, from which he was raised from the dead. We gather around the Lord's table to receive this gift of grace that saves us. Which is foolishness, Paul writes, to those who are perishing. This gift of grace through the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing, but not to those who believe. For we are one through the waters of holy baptism and the body and blood of the one who gave his life for us all. That unity, not uniformity, that unity binds us to Christ as it binds us one to another. And it's that unity that, Paul, that, uh, that uh, Hilton writes, he believes, can save the world. When we read this book together, we acknowledge that we will not always see eye to eye on every issue. It's unlikely. It would be a miracle. It would be a God thing, for sure. There always have been and always will be differences of opinion within the body of Christ. However, our unity does not necessitate uniformity. In fact, I think it is through our diverse tapestry of opinions and experiences that we can most fully express what it means to be the body of Christ. We have each been given gifts. Paul writes later in his letter to the Corinthians. And each of those gifts make up the church, much like each of the different body parts make up a body. However, that diversity can create conflict and differences of opinion that can lead to hurt feelings. As the can and does happen in every relationship. So in an effort to demonstrate our desire to be one, to have unity, Back in 2019, we created and adopted a relational covenant. Did you know that? Who's aware that we have a relational covenant? That's what I thought. (laughs) The relational covenant reminds us of our call to love one another because of our differences. To love one another because of our differences, not in spite of them. For it points us to Jesus as being the one in whom we are united. That relational covenant is a very well-written, spiritually grounded document. But we knew it was unlikely to inspire us to seek the unity that we were talking about. So we printed it up. It's hung throughout the church building. You may have seen it. You've probably walked by it a thousand times. And I don't think a one of us could, could quote any part of it. Anyone want to give it a shot? <laughs> It's based on the acrostic grace, G-R-A-C-E. That's as much as I remember. And I help write it. So knowing that that would not be transformative, we decided we needed to develop a practice as a body, as a church. So we crafted the prayer for unity so that we could pray together regularly that we might be one. This prayer that we do at the end of every worship service is based upon that reading from John 17, verses 20 to 23, really. In that reading, Jesus prayed to God that his followers might be one, like he is one with the Father. That's the basis of that prayer. So we pray that we might be one as Jesus is one with the Father. 
But that oneness does not necessitate uniformity. We don't need to become the same in every way. But we do strive to have unity in and through Christ. Because it is in and through him that we are healed. That we are made whole. That we are given new life. Which is a need each and every one of us has. And that way, we are all the same. We are all sinners. Some of us better than others, at it than others. Each of our sinfulness unique to who we are and to the things that we struggle with and and unique in the ways that we live our lives. But we are each equally in need of Jesus. Each equally in need of the redemptive, life-giving love of God. So in unity, we pray, so in Christ, we pray for the unity at the beginning of every meeting that we have as a congregation. Much like we have traditionally prayed the Lord's Prayer at its conclusion. And just as we have faith, and we don't know how, but just as we have faith when we pray the Lord's Prayer that God's kingdom will come, because we pray that it will be so, We pray with the same faith that God, in a way that we don't understand, can and will indeed make us one. Unify us in the name of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, at work within us and among us. And through that same power, that same gracious, life-giving love, we can and will change the world around us. That it might become less divided, less caustic, less angry, and more loving.